the people who saw the area that is now Strathcona Park was mostly the merchants on Campbell River. They saw the beauty of the mountains there and it reminded them of the Alps and they called it actually Little Switzerland. I think there were probably people who, who saw a, a very rugged, beautiful section of Vancouver Island. It's a centerpiece of Vancouver Island, the highest mountains, the glaciers, etc. They saw that and they saw this has national park potential. I think that the objective sort of mirrored the idea along the lines of Banff and Jasper. And no doubt they had in mind that you could have little lodges in there and the tourists would come by the droves. I'm sure there was a two-pronged approach, one to preserve the area and two, monetary. At the same time, I'm not sure that they didn't also think there's a lot of potential mining and forestry in the same area. They didn't necessarily exclude them from a concept of a park. It was his personal multidiscipline party. There were geographers, there were geologists, and even his 19-year-old daughter. They started in Campbell River, and, and they beat their way up, up, up the Campbell River, past Elk Falls, and up Campbell Lake and Bottle Lake. And as a side trip, they took, they took a trip to the top of Crown Mountain. One of the highlights was this 19-year-old daughter of Price Ellison. She had a, a Union a Jack with her, and they had a bottle of uh, bubbly or something or another, and she cracked that open on the top of the mountain, planting the Union Jack there. Other resource values were in the mind of government right from the beginning. I think in 1918, the Strathcona Park Act was changed to admit uh, the damming of uh, free-flowing waters. And of course, the major changes in the 1920s to, um, uh, to allow for crown granting of mineral claims. It was when the veterans came home from the first war, that government had to make employment opportunities available and they opened the park up to staking of uh, mineral claims. I think it was about 1945 that Hydro was given authority to go ahead with uh, the John Hart development. By the time we uh, came on scene by 1949, the dam was finished, the water was backed up, and uh, Lower Campbell Lake was a reservoir. The next thing, of course, was it was an extension of that power production system, and uh, that one created a lot of debate, because the next step was uh, in 1953, to go dam Upper Campbell Lake with the Lador Dam, and that would flood back into Strathcona. I was able to get up to Bud Lake, and I saw that first in 1935, I guess it was. And it was a, a veritable uh, paradise. I mean, you, you, you can't imagine uh, what a gem it was. Even after ha having seen many, many lakes across British Columbia, I think the original Bud Lake was the most beautiful lake that I encountered. It was absolutely beautiful because of the huge primeval forest around it and the crystal clarity of the water. We fought hard to save Bottle Lake. We wanted them to, to raise Bottle Lake to the high water line so it, wouldn't, it would have flooded up at Campbell. 
but it wouldn't have spoilt bottles. But all that lovely timber on those big deltas there, yeah, that's gone. Rodhead Brown was, was the one who almost single-handedly fought the powers that be, you see. He opposed the flooding of Campbell Lakes and, and Bottle Lake. Had the public been aware of how beautiful Bottle Lake was, we'd never have lost it. I can remember coming to the park when I did in 68 and looking at the, the logging that took place to create the reservoir for, for the dam. And I, I'm saying to my, why would you do this to this? It's a park. As soon as the reservoir was done, mining came to the fore again. Ken Kiernan, who had been Minister of Mines and Petroleum Resources, became Minister of Recreation and Conservation in 1963. One of the early things he did was announce that there was going to be a change in the regulations that affected mining and prospecting in provincial parks and that they were going to be eased. We, the Parks Agency, was really uh, an enabling agency for the mining to continue. <laughs> we, uh, we enabled what they wanted to do. Over the years there were mining controversies, there were if you dig back through the Victoria Papers in particular, there were, there were, there were occasional cartoons about the latest um, release of timber rights and whatnot, I think in the, through the 70s, uh, as, as Strathmore was being used as a bit of a bank to uh, obtain lands elsewhere. For instance, they wanted Pacific Rim Park on western Vancouver Island, and the logging company wanted to get compensated for the trees that would be lost to make a park. So the government looked at Strathcona Park and said, oh, we have the Bedwell Valley. How about if we give you the trees of the Bedwell Valley in return for Pacific Rim? They were trading it for things, you know, politi politicians were, were dishing it out. It was just turning into, as I say, a goodie bag. The goodie bag, I would say we cannibalized it to do exactly that. It's never a good thing to do, to trade off one park asset in order to get another. But there was never enough money to make the acquisitions, major acquisitions that we wanted to make. So out of desperation, rather than good management, uh, we put forward proposals that enabled uh, us to uh, exchange timber out of parks for purchase of parkland elsewhere. And I would agree that that's not the way to do it. But we've done that with the park system as a whole. Not just Strathcona, but in Strathcona, it's in one place where you can see what we've screwed around with. And it's a lesson to be learned. However, it's a lesson that I think it continues to repeat itself. It's the park that, that has all the scars and wounds and, and, and the negative decisions that, that politicians make around the protected area system. It was an external government committee and giving advice on a number of wilderness areas in the province. Strathcona was kind of tacked on to its job. It wasn't really a, a primary part of its focus, and it didn't really have much time to look at Strathcona. So its recommendations said, there are some boundary changes that would make sense. We haven't had much time or information about them. They need to be studied, there needs to be public consultation, and then maybe go ahead. Well, there was two issues, I guess. There was the rejigging of the boundaries of the park and the reclassification of different portions of the park to allow mineral activity to occur. And the permit we issued to Cream Silver to start additional drilling in the uh, Thelwood Valley. And that was the break point. And that's when everybody started marching, protesting in real earnest. I got a call this Friday night that to get up to Price Creek the next morning, this was in um, January of 1988, so I was up there at noon the next day and there was already a, a party blocking the road. I was very scared, just like everybody else. I think everybody had the same feeling. We were scared. And at the same time, we felt somebody has to draw the line. Somebody has to say no. 
because if we all kind of roll over and let the big machine of development roll over our country, we end up with nothing. Sort of a mass arrest where they had dozens of, of individuals were arrested for protesting the, the mine drilling. And so it all happened. It just happened. People just came and volunteered to be arrested. Yeah, well, one of them happened to be my wife, which, which uh, <laughs> was a complete surprise to me. And, uh, the first thing I knew, I was trying to get pictures of all the, the works there, the dr mine drilling rig, etc. And I looked around for Pat, and I couldn't see her anywhere. And uh, finally, I looked over at the mine drilling rig, and there she was. Uh, uh, in the mud there, singing out with the others around her, this is our park. <laughs> she spent an, quite an uncomfortable night in the Campbell River lockup. That was very scary because I felt responsible. Some of these people spent time in jail. They would go to the courts, and I felt very responsible for that. By that time, BC Parks, in the eyes of the Friends of Strathcona, had, and, and for the environmental community as a whole, had lost its reputation of being a dependable organization to look after parks. This thing blew up and that's when I got involved to look at Strathcona as a whole and then I really got involved when we had to develop a master plan for Strathcona. The first public meeting we had was in Campbell River. The place was packed. The first guy that got up and I don't know if he was an environmentalist, a logger or a miner, but I will never forget what he said. I would like to have my say. I don't necessarily want my way, but if I can't have my say, I'll have my way. Wow, that registered. Really what he was saying is, when you're asking people to participate, seriously listen to what we're saying, and then we'll trust you with the decisions you make. If we know you've seriously heard what we said, and taking it into consideration. We have a vision, it's called the Master Plan. Once we fought for Strathcona Park, when we were in the final throes of completing it, we worked very hard to create a document that is a vision for the park. One of the high points in my career was, was signing the master plan for Strathcona Park and BC's first park and after what we went through, um, the public meetings, the, the hours and hours and hours of effort to, uh, to try to get that thing through to fruition, uh, it was a very proud moment. Whether it was the final plan and, and it removed all other conflict and whatnot, nothing is ever the complete answer. So we have had a few issues. Timber West put a road through the parks without any proper consultation. So we took that to court on the question if the government can make that sort of decisions without proper consultation. And that judgment was won. We won that one. We still lost that part of the park, but at least we now know that we can go further. When decisions affecting a public legacy like a park system or a park should always be made in the public forum. Transparency. And that applies also to government. And that wasn't taking place. It's so easy for government, especially if you have a government with ministers in it that have connections to people who have private vested interests that can be enhanced with what's in a park, be it a visitor opportunity that they want to sell in terms of tourism, be it mineral claims. If these decisions are made in public, they'll be the right decisions. There is only one protection for a provincial park system, and that is a body public 
that is aware of the system, loves the system, and wants it retained in its present form. If you don't have that body of public support out there, you can have the best legislation in the world and regulations, uh, you can't hold the line. We could have a party out there uh, this weekend uh, if we had to. Nothing like bodies on the line to get the message across, especially old ones. <laughs> I got a bumper sticker on my car, a car and on every car that I've had since 19, 1957, I guess. Love Strathcona Park. So I guess it is a logical result that if we fight tooth and nail to get this park pristine and to hold the government to their duty, to have proper public process and to respect the vision and opinion of the people, to realize they are the stewards of this park, is a trust, um, it will be fine.